what is up everybody we are here again today on the rogue trainer youtube channel for a rogue rundown of the english burning shadows set list and spoilers so we don't exactly use spoiler alerts but just as a courtesy spoiler alert in case you want to find out about these cards at the pre-release this upcoming weekend but anyways we want to dive right into it right now because this set is very important, especially because it will be legal for the 2017 World Championships. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to go down each and every card. I'm going to give my initial impression about the card as a whole. I am going to offer ideas for maybe ways to abuse that card if there are any for the World Championships. And in addition to that, I will offer ideas for things that the card maybe could be useful for when the format rotates and we have the breakthrough on for 2017-2018. And last of all, anything else I might think of for other formats like Expanded. So let's jump right into it. And you know what, just as a little bit of a rundown of how things are going to work, I will be actually time stamping a lot of these important cards for you guys because... I don't know about you, but when I'm watching a really long video, which is what this is going to be, I think it's really important that I have an idea of where the most important things are. So there are going to be a lot of situations where I'm going to look at a card and I'm going to say this is awful, there's nothing you can do about it, because in the spirit of doing a complete rundown, that's what we want to do. We want to be able to look at every single card and maybe offer ideas for ways to abuse it, but if there aren't any, then I'll at least think of enough to say that at the point. So let's go ahead and hop right into it. So we got Caterpie, thanks to Pokebeach.com for the latest spoilers and the latest news about all trading card game information, including in Japan and otherwise. So we've got Caterpie, which does 20 on a coin flip. Next. We've got Metapod, next. And here we go, so we've got Butterfree, and I'm not going to get too much into the flavor text here, but you notice that attack Bye Bye Healing, that's a little bit of a callback to the Pokemon anime, because there's that big dramatic moment in one of the first 15 episodes where Ash is crying about leaving his Butterfree behind to go mate and die or whatever. But at any rate, the attack, so the attack Bye Bye Healing, it heals all damage from all all of your Pokemon and the condition for that is shuffling it in. Now granted the standard format for 2016 to now has been very based off of attrition wars and by that I mean we have two shot knockouts. We don't necessarily have a whole lot of situations where a deck is winning on one hits alone. Exceptions that include Rayquaza and Volcanion but for the most part it's been a little bit of a struggle of one shot two shot and Butterfly may offer a little bit of an opportunity to mess around with that by healing everything in play, but it's very, very situational, and you just don't have a enough time to really be messing around with that. So I my initial impression is that that's a waste of space. Things may change, especially with Whale Lord going into 2016-2017 World Championships. Uh, I mean, I'm not really that big of a fan, but... Who knows? All right, so Oddish. Now, you guys know I'm typecast as a Decidueye Vileplume guy. I see this and immediately get excited because it's immediately a better basic than the one from Ancient Origins. And the reason why is the Ancient Origins one for one grass energy does 10. The, Ancient, the Burning Shadows one poisons. So what's the difference? Well, Poison can actually stick. Poison can do a little bit more. So if you actually have some reason to use poison powder, that might actually make a big difference in the long run. So in the same spirit of that, let's take a look at Gloom. So Gloom is flat out better than its Ancient Origins counterpart because it already did 30 for 2. It already had 80 HP. I think maybe the downside is this 2 retreat cost. That's not really that appealing. But the fact that you can confuse your opponent is actually kind of cool. So I would say that if somebody's running a Vileplume deck either for Worlds or if they want to run it in an expanded tournament next format, next season, then it's kind of an interesting idea. You know, I'm, I'm going to be perfectly honest. A lot of these I'm having an impression of for the very first time. I 
wanted to take a look at what the exact cards would be before I jumped any conclusions. So I obviously didn't know that much about the gloom going into this review, but yeah, I mean, like, on paper, for the most part, it's better, but this two retreat cost is just, I, I don't know, that's just really painful, so I think that's more of a toss-up than the Oddish going into your Valpham variant, so speaking of which, let's take a look at the most influential option we have here. We have Vile Plume from Burning Shadows with a very special ability. It's not irritating anymore. It is disgusting pollen. And essentially what we have here is an auto block on basic Pokemon attacking completely. So what's the significance there? Well, that can be really significant for a lot of bad matchups for Vile Plume decks, including Fire decks, which are generally based off of big basic attackers. So if all you have single vile plume in play that can make a big difference for actual volcanian players metagaming this card really isn't that relevant for the world championships i would say though that it is a pretty decent card maybe as a tech in something on the other hand i think that trainer lock is a lot more valuable and a lot more useful in all sorts of matchups so then you have to ask yourself if you're going into the anaheim open under the 2017 world championships is it a good idea to run a third vile plume that isn't irritating pollen well it's pretty interesting for the most part i think that more testing will have to be used but there's definitely a lot of potential and for the breakthrough on format i don't actually think that that can be too big of a deal as a card because as you guys have kind of noticed the metagame and the play testing situation that Pokemon Card Laboratories is getting into, they seem to be wanting to take us off of being addicted to big basic Pokemon. So I don't know if it's going to have as big of a home in Breakthrough or not, especially because there's no other reason to play it and because there's no Forest to Giant Plants in Breakthrough on, but there's potential there. So if there's some sort of amazing big basic deck, then you might want to keep an eye on it. So Tangrowth is, excuse me, Tangola is kind of interesting because as a pre-evolved Pokemon for Tangrowth, you can lock things with bind down, so you might want to keep that in mind if there is a good Tangrowth deck available. Uh, this is a pretty generic healing attack. Very mediocre damage on crosswise whip or whatever for four energy. I mean, maybe that could be marginally decent with Victini, but I don't really know. I don't trust it. So, Lady Bud, nothing too exciting to write home about. We've got Lady Anne. It is basically in the exact same situation as Tangrowth. And you know what? If you compare the two cards like, back to back, it's almost like they're almost the same card in a way. It's just maybe the Tangrowth is marginally better. I don't know, but I think they're both bad cards. Now, this is a little bit more interesting. So the Heracross in several formats especially the either of the standard formats either for 2017 worlds or for the next season is kind of cool because the whole idea here is guts so the cool thing about guts if you survive on the coin flip if you get heads on that coin flip then you essentially buy yourself a turn now celebi the promo celebi with the time recall ability is arguably better because it doesn't get if you win the coin flip it doesn't get left in play and the reason why that's probably better is because in addition to conserving resources you also don't leave a damaged pokemon out there so in case there's some sort of ability lock maybe an expanded or something like that then you don't suddenly become really vulnerable the attack is kind of generic but I think there's some potential there. There may especially be some potential with Vile Plume or anything that can make Guts more reliable. So I'm just going to ignore the, the Sages. They're always bad, and that seems like a running gag for the past like six years, is that any of these trio monkeys from Black and White are just bad cards. I, I don't think... like the, the, uh, the Breakthrough monkeys are actually not that bad. In the right setting but these that, that's just awful so 
Let's take a look at Dewpiter. Now, the only reason Dewpiter is interesting is because it's grass type. Why is that important? Well, we've got a narrow window of opportunity to evolve things really fast in the standard format in an almost guaranteed way, and that's Forest of Giant Plants. So this Dewpiter will give us access to the Sun and Moon Araquanid pretty decently because, hey, you know what? Grass type evolves into a water type first turn if you have forest in play. Cool. Problem is the water type Araquanid that blocks all fire damage done to it isn't nearly as good now because Volcanion's running Tapu Lele, meaning that you can pretty easily play around it. But it's worth keeping an eye on. So speaking of things to keep an eye on, we've got the Araquanid from this set, Burning Shadows, and Bubble Net is a pretty interesting attack, shutting off any energy attachments to the defending Pokemon. Vile Bloom in play, that can get pretty frustrating. I don't know if it's more than a cute idea after further thought, but there's definitely some potential there. And of course, these guys, these guys are the big deal. These guys are getting a ton of hype. We've got Wimpod with the Wimp Out ability. That is the only reason we want to run this Wimpod. I think other than that, this one's about on par with the one from Guardians Rising, but free retreat cost at any point in the game is incredible, even if you have to have three retreat later on. So all Glissopod decks, even ones for some weird reason not running the GX version, they want to run that Wimpod. Going to Glissopod GX, we have the first impression attack dealing 120 if it became the active Pokemon from the bench during your turn. So significance there. That is a relatively conditional attack as people have shown, but as a lot of other people have shown at this point, it's a pretty easy to meet condition. I mean, let's just think about it. I mean, in addition to all sorts of incredible abilities like Zoroark stand in from Breakthrough, first impression is extremely easy to trigger because of another card we're going to talk about later on in this review. And of course the other attacks are pretty interesting. Armor Press is kind of mediocre. I don't think that the 20 less is ever going to be too much of a deal. And in a lot of the different grass decks, you might be running Glissopod GX. I don't know if you will want to use Crossing Cut GX. It's not a situation like with Tapu Bulu GX where you actually see a real solid advantage to abusing it. But here, you're just dealing 150, and the switch is kind of irrelevant. But before we move on, let's just think about how big the first impression damage can get. Well, you've seen Shintaro Ito from Japan placing third in their national championship equivalent with a Glissopod Decidueye deck. And that's actually pretty cool because you break it down and you're not dealing 120 damage, you're dealing a lot more than that. With Choice Band, you're dealing 150. With Feather Arrows, if you're playing with, uh, with uh, excuse me, Decidueye, then you're one-shotting a Tapu Lele, which is insane. I talked about this in one of the interviews I did with Trainer Chip a while ago, but essentially Tapu Lele is the new Shaman, where I think with Power Creep evolving the way that it is, it's actually surprisingly easy to get up to 170 damage for a knockout. Of course, if you don't like Decidueye, there are other ways to go about it. You can maybe run the Lorantis promo, you can maybe even run a straight Glissopod deck with neither and run, say, like Professor Kukui as a tech. But I would say that anything lets you Guzma out Tapu Leles or whatever, I, I think doing that is probably better than using your supporter on plus 20 damage. So moving on, this Charmander, cool art, but nothing special. Charmeleon, nothing special. Let's take a look at. Charizard GX. So, I think that we're suffering the exact same situation we always do with Charizard, where we're in a situation where it's just not that good. Not that good. Because 70 for 3 is really nothing special at all in this format. And to be completely honest with you guys, it was nothing special 10 years ago. 10 years ago, let alone right now. But, 
we're taking a look at this card for the Crimson Storm attack, which deals a lot. That's essentially the new Mega Rayquaza. This is going to be, for you collectors out there, it's going to be an expensive card. Not for you competitive players. You guys aren't going to care about it one bit. But 300 damage, discard 3 energy from it, and maybe try to get it into play. Like, maybe. And then there's the GX attack, which just discards the top 10 cards of your opponent's deck. That can actually be pretty neat the only problem is it's like the rest of charizard stuff it's just tough to get out okay i mean it's not something that you can really easily get out in any format except maybe like the pre-release format that's possibly the best hope that you've got moving on to ho gx this is actually a card that's worth paying a lot of attention to and the reason why I say that is because it has so many different uses in so many different situations. It, first off, having a lightning weakness instead of a water weakness like most fire Pokemon do, instantly gives a lot of value to Volcanion, which is a relevant deck not only for next month at the Worlds Tournament, but for the entire next season where Volcanion, surprise, surprise, is entirely legal. And so we've already got a couple decent attacks, nothing incredible. I mean, 50 to anything for 3 is okay, and 180 for 4, like, in a deck like Volcanion, that's not exactly that incredible, because, I mean, you look at Turtonator, that's already dealing 160 for 3, and you use a Steam Up, and then you essentially get the same effect. But, I don't know, I mean, like, while that's actually a pretty good thing for Turtonator like it's it's still good to play Turtonator in the deck but and it's I think it probably outclasses Ho-Oh for the most part in terms of relevance but I think you might want to play just for diversity's sake so if you're going into worlds and you want to use Volcanion deck it might not hurt to consider how popular water is going to be I know that just thinking back to nationals to the NAIC they're there was a decent showing for water, kinda, because, uh, I mean, Ninetales was a big deal. Uh, Alola Ninetales was a big deal in Igor's deck and Gustavo's deck. But, uh, I mean, like, water box and things like that, I just don't know if I'd worry about that. And here is where the scrub in me gets really excited the Eternal Flame GX attack, where you're putting three of any fire ex or gx it doesn't have to be a basic it can be an evolved pokemon it can be a mega pokemon you're putting them directly into play if they were discarded now unfortunately between the standard format and 17 18 format we don't really have any reliable way to guarantee that our fire pokemon our evolved fire pokemon get into the discard pile so what that means is the vast majority of the really cool possible combo ideas for this card will be in expanded and the reason why i say that is because in expanded you've got battle compressor which lets you discard three of any cards in your deck that means you can discard evolve pokemon that means you can discard fire energy which leads me directly into another expanded card which is incredible is blacksmith so you'll be able to attach two fire from your discard pile to the ho gx meaning that our combo idea is play a battle compressor discard two fire and evolve pokemon play blacksmith and then eternal flame gx now that might not necessarily be a good way to abuse the attack to its full potential because remember it's put three not put one put three pokemon ex or gx into play from your discard pile so that may need to be thought on a little bit that may need to be stewed over a little bit i think maybe like a list with max battle compressor could be pretty good so i encourage you guys just to explore it as much as you can so we already talked about how horrible monkeys are so we're not even going to worry about that and let's take a look at heat more so heat more is kind of a cool card i'm not sure how incredible it is but it is definitely a cool card for one and only one reason the odor sleuth attack because it gives you for two colorless and two coin flips up to two cards from your discard pile to go back in your hand immediately. So 
a lot of you guys who have been playing the Sidui Vile Plume a lot of the season know how great Hollow Hunt GX is. Well, imagine being able to use Hollow Hunt GX in any deck, maybe on a coin flip, but without nearly as much liability and being able to save your GX attack. Well, that is the cool thing about Odor Sleuth because I think if you find the right deck for it, then this card can be incredible. Now, Expanded is a little bit too fast-paced. Seismitoad's still legal in Standard, or excuse me, Expanded 2, so it's not quite as capable in that format, but I think in the current Standard format, there's certainly some potential, and definitely in upcoming Standard formats, past worlds, there's a little bit of potential too. Now let's take a look at Salazzle GX. I think this was in a promo set in Japan originally, but actually there are lots of cool attacks here. So Diabolical Claws does 50 for each prize card you've already taken. Inherently kind of a balanced attack in the first half of the game because it isn't dealing that much damage at that point. But I think in a late game situation, it can be a nice sweeper. I don't know what format it would be best suited for for that purpose. Uh, honestly, I think a lot of the top tier might struggle to that attack after the first two prizes because you find a way to draw those prizes and then from there it could just be downhill for whoever's playing against it. I mean, Volcanion, maybe there's a reason why Volcanion is still so much more popular in Japan right now, but I kind of like the idea of being able to close out a game with just... 150, 200, 250, boom, done. Because thinking about it, like, against Garbodor, you draw two prizes and then you're basically going to auto win the game. Well, maybe, maybe not, because they might run Vaporeon in their list, but who knows. And Heat Blast, 110 for two, that's actually pretty solid. I think the whole balancing act of this card is it can't abuse double colorless at all which is a good thing and queen's haze gx basically just nuking all the energy on your opponent's active pokemon that can be okay definitely not the best of all the different gx attacks you could be using but certainly worth considering all in all like in the standard formats especially i'd keep an eye on this card i think that it is very underrated there are a lot of cards that are worthy of hype in this set but this card in particular seems like it has really efficient damage output like if i bet money on something being the mega adino of last year where it was a card nobody expected to be good nobody expected to do well but then it comes out of nowhere and wins worlds this actually seems like it has that potential i mean we already talked a little bit about how it can be good against garbodor against sidui decks it can be pretty good if it has its own dedicated list because i mean same thing once you've drawn two prizes it's over i mean maybe you need some way to consistently guarantee that you get salazzles out and maybe you need some way to draw those first two prizes but i think that's not too hard to overcome i spent enough time talking about that let's look at turtonator and 130 hp is a little bit better than the ones we've been seeing recently from the past couple sets uh flame cloak now you you guys all know about Evil Tall Oblivion Wing from the XY expansion, and then Steam Siege. Essentially, this is a bad Evil Tall. This is a bad Evil Tall. This is a bad baby Volcanion. It's just not really that special. And speaking of bad versions of previous cards, we've got Alolan Vulpix. And the whole theme behind the Alolan Pokemon is they have some sort of cool free attack. Well, the free attack here is not searching your deck for two Pokemon and putting them in your hand. It's not bailing you out of bad hands in bad situations. It's just trying to put your opponent to sleep. That is garbage. Next card. Alolan Ninetales. This is one of the saddest exclusions from Guardians Rising. I think it was possible since this was a promo card and had a chance to be legal. For whatever reason, they decided not to make it legal. And that probably made all the difference for the Decidui Ninetales list that went into the North American International Championships because those decks could have run this card to great effect because it has a unique ability in the game right now. And I say that very specifically right now because there's a card with a similar ability that'll come out in the next set. And it prevents all effects of attacks, including damage, done to 
Alolan Ninetales by EX and GX. So it's a perfect wall against EXs and GXs unless your opponent runs Garbotoxin, which is actually pretty common, or they run Hexmaniac, which people are always kind of on the fence about running. What's the significance here? Well, what this means is that against some decks, you might be able to steal a game outright. This has been happening for several years since EXs were introduced into the game, and then GXs, where if you're able to block your opponent from being able to do anything and attack, then you can just sit there and deck them out. That's a possibility, but I think the more likely thing is you can vie for board position. And what I mean by that is you aren't necessarily waiting for them to deck out, but by leaving that insurmountable wall up there, you can play around your whatever your opponent is doing, and if you have a bad matchup, you might be able to steal that game away with Luminous Barrier. So inherently in the expanded format, there isn't quite as much value in running a safeguarder like this. Waylord though, Waylord EX, which was a big splash, no pun intended, at the 2015 National Championship, could potentially get some new life thanks to this thing because that deck ran Suicune Plasma Blast, which prevented all effects of attacks, including damage done to it by EXs. Well, that's not nearly as good anymore because EXs don't have, or excuse me, GXs don't have some sort of grandfathered clause, so you have to run something specifically to deal with EX and GX. This could be it. So moving right on, we have the Horsey and Cedra family pretty decent pre-evolutions for Kingdra, but nothing to write home about in and of themselves, but for Kingdra we've got Brine, which does a clean 90 to any of your opponent's Pokemon with damage counters, so that's actually pretty efficient. Unfortunately we're in a spot where 140 HP is getting progressively worse nowadays, I know that sounds crazy, but that's where we're at, so it's not quite as strong as it used to be. But. I think that Brian can be pretty effective if you have some way to get damage on it. And speaking of which, this card is really energy efficient. That's always been the gimmick of all Kingdra cards ever, is energy efficiency for really cool things. And this does a clean 90 for 1. You discard the water energy, which is a little bit of a drawback, but not that big of a deal when you only run a single energy attacker. And it does 30 to one of your opponent's bench Pokemon. So. Historically, 90-30 has been incredible throughout the years. I don't think it's quite as special in the expanded formats because there are other things that can do that and a lot more reliably than evolving a Pokemon. Maybe not getting out of the plays late as turn 3 or turn 4, but it's definitely something to something worth keeping an eye out on. I don't know if it has too much potential at the World Championships, but I think the metagame is right. A card like this could be... Okay. Now, moving right along, so Magikarp, not anything terribly special. And here we are, and I've actually, this is one of the few cards that I saw before this review, and I thought it's pretty cool, especially maybe when combined with or replacing Gyarados from Ancient Origins, because you have 50 times the number of Magikarp in your discard pile. That instantly allows you to take an alternate strategy against bad matchups. So, by that I mean bad matchups for the Ancient Origins Gyarados, which does a lot more damage for each Magikarp with damage counters on your bench. So, bad matchups obviously for that kind of a Gyarados deck or decks that deal damage or damage counters to bench Pokemon. And running this Gyarados lets you get around that because your damage output is no longer based on having damaged Pokemon, it's based off of having discarded Pokemon. This is actually kind of a marginally worse reprinted version of a Gyarados from sets ago, but I think if you find the right combo for it, it can actually be pretty good. Now, I don't think it's that special in Expanded. I don't really know, to be perfectly honest, if it has that much potential in Standard even because, I mean, unfortunately I don't think that, like, okay, so the maximum you're dealing with this Gyarados by itself as Gyarados being the attacker is 150 before a choice ban. So that's actually okay against like Tapu Leles and things, but there are big GX attackers that are stage twos, and I think they handle this thing beautifully. I think they cream it. 
but maybe in the right setting maybe it could be okay but i think if you want something to try to one shot tabulae laser something like that galissapod would be better meryl bad azumarill has a thick fat ability it can be kind of decent in general that ability but on this card it's pretty bad we got garbage monkeys we don't like to talk about those and uh now we are at Bruxish, and that's kind of like a mediocre Nami X Darkrai, kinda. Tap. Okay, here we go. Here's actually a pretty good card, and I've seen this one a little bit before already. So Tapu Fini. We got lots of different options here. The first attack isn't anything too crazy, but hey, I'll take it if I can. <clears throat> Hydro Shot. I think this card was born in the wrong era because if Water Dex had some easy way to knock out a Shaman without having to play a Lysander or a Guzma, it'd be incredible. But Tabulele is a new Shaman. HP on everything across the board is a lot higher. So Hydro Shot just is a rule of thumb, isn't quite what it used to be. But who knows? I mean, between no weakness and being able to kill shamans, maybe this is just what water decks needed to have a good Decidueye matchup. And then the GX attack, shuffling in your opponent's active Pokemon if they have a bench, that's actually pretty good. I am thinking about what kind of a home that might have. I think that it could be very splashable in the right deck. There are a lot more options than just running it in a water deck. You could run it in a deck playing Rainbow, for example. In Expanded, you can run it in a deck running Blend WLFM. So, I mean, Garchomp is not that good of a, good of a deck. Garchomp, Altaria. But who knows? I mean, maybe you can run it in that. And we've got the Raichu line. Raichu's getting kind of cool right now because we are at a spot where you could be running this leave your opponent's active Pokemon paralyzed Raichu with Raichu break but unfortunately Guzma is in this set we will get into gory detail about how good Guzma is but I'm a little worried that what would be a very good ability is kind of nerfed by that so I mean maybe it'll have a home but there's a pretty good chance that with this mediocre attack and not really much else. I don't know how good it will be. We've got the Electivire family. Electivire family. This is actually kind of nifty. I mean, it's a it's a big Nani X Pokemon with damage output to potentially one shot a GX, which is cool. And we've actually seen a couple cards like this before, like Golurk from Asian Origins, things like that. They have that potential to put that sort of damage on the board, but I think the downside for Electivire is that it just costs too much. We've got Tynamo. I'm always out on the lookout for a new Tynamo to add to Electric decks and Expanded. And this is... This Tynamo's attack really isn't that good, but maybe metal resistance might be relevant, so it's worth keeping an eye out on. And we've got, huh. So we've got an electric. Obviously, you don't want to run this electric over Dynamo or electric and expanded, but its attack is kind of niche, which inherently gives options to all these other decks. And essentially, you are limited on what you can damage this with. So it does nothing if their HP is high and it's only 50. Next. You've got Electros. And this is kind of a shame that, I mean, I'm looking at these cards and all I'm thinking about is their potential and expanded, but I think to electrics credit from noble victories that card is just really really good and so inherently people are always thinking about what that thing can do and here i think we have a couple interesting attacks blocking retreat is always kind of cool and 
This is actually pretty neat, this vacuum bolt attack. I think this is something you may want to keep an eye out on in Expanded if the Electric still has a home in Expanded because there have been many Electros attackers that give you some sort of late game prize option in Expanded. The Electros from Dark Explorers gives you a 60 to anything and gust up ability, excuse me, an attack, not an ability. And then the Plasma Electros from Plasma Blast with enough energy in play gives you the opportunity to one-shot things. But I think this is a lot cleaner because you don't have to discard a whole bunch of energy. You only have to discard three. Or excuse me, you don't have to discard three. You only have to play three on it. So Electros 80, deal 80, bite the bullet and deal 80 to something on your bench. But if you have a choice band in play on the Electros, you're one-shotting a whole lot of stuff. So. I would consider maybe running this as a one of in expanded for electric decks. And Token and Maru, nothing special. We've got Slow King, and this is pretty cool and pretty rare where you have essentially the end mega effect with this Pokemon because it lets you attack for free, but only if you have no cards in your hand. So let's think about that a little deeper. No cards in your hand. So in a lot of situations, that's actually too vulnerable to even risk thinking about because if you have no cards in your hand, you might just dead draw and lose. But it can be pretty good with Octillery from Breakthrough because with Octillery, you have a way to draw cards again. It can be good with a Ranguru from Sun and Moon because same thing, draw cards again. I think maybe the most efficient way to run this, I don't know if you could run it as its own deck, but 110 for free is actually really really cool so i would go ahead and keep an eye on it for all formats not just standard but all formats and maybe think about some ways to abuse this maybe the most efficient way to do it wouldn't be to run a clunky stage one line because i mean you're gonna get into a situation where you deal unarmed for 110 free energy top deck something unplayable you can't do anything and that's a lot more likely with like an artillery line but if you run a ringaru then you can set it up to the point where all the cards you're running in your deck can be played. And if you can do that, then I don't think it's going to be that big of a deal. Moving on to Wobbuffet. <clears throat> We've got Shadowy Knot 50 times for each colorless in your opponent's active retreat cost. We want to... If, if, there, if there's really potential for this, which there might be, I would say that you derive it from stadiums. So, like Team Aqua Secret Base for Worlds 2017. We've got Po Town for this set for future formats. I think there are a lot of options, but for the most part, it seems like it's a pretty gimmicky attack. I mean, if you set it up just right, this could be pretty good, but you gotta find a way to get that energy on first. So, maybe table it for now and look at it later. So, Moving on, we've got Seviper with its an ability. More poison, adequately named, more poison, very creative. Put one more damage counter for poison Pokemon. Well, <clears throat> this is pretty niche, but I mean, it can be okay because it's a bulky basic. That's a lot better than most support basics for 100 HP. I would say that in Expanded, where you have lots of free ways to deal poison, like Hypnotoxic Laser, it can be pretty good. Maybe for Worlds 2017. Ariados from Ancient Origins suddenly does not become awful anymore. Maybe it's marginally better. So worth keeping an eye out on. I think that there's some ways you could combo this card. But you'd have to justify the space. And you have to justify the bench space too. The Dusk Noir family is pretty cool. Always need to randomly grab Pokemon in your opponent's discard and put them onto your bench. I think that's really frustrating kind of a generic dust clops not a whole lot to write home to but we've got dust nor which actually has a lot of potential so i would think a lot about all sorts of different dark invitation combos because putting a pokemon from your opponent's hand into play and putting three on it that has a lot of potential in addition to free damage and maybe setting up things for easy knockouts i think you also have the potential to disrupt your opponent too by 
shutting off Tapu Lele by keeping your opponent from being able to wonder tag. That's actually a really big deal. Now, one gimmicky strategy you'll probably see lots of people mess around with is the breakthrough slash generations Gengar being played with this because the whole gimmick is Dusknor Gengar, put a Pokemon into play, put three onto it, automatically knock it out with the Gengar. Problem is, that Gengar costs like a Psychic and a Colorless, so it's pretty tough to meet in any of the standard formats, but in Expanded, it's a completely different case because that attack is suddenly for free. So, I would say where, or excuse me, not for, <laughs> excuse me, not for free, but it only costs one energy because of Dimension Valley. So, I think either way, you will definitely want to keep an eye on that for the future. I wouldn't worry so much about it right now, at least that deck combo. And of course, Mind Jack, really good attack. I think it's even better when you're dealing thirty plus. Now, I don't know how easily a 150 HP Pokemon will survive and to be perfectly honest if I'm like a GX attack player I'm not really that worried about this but definitely worth keeping an eye out on I think it could have some sleeper potential for next month and then we've got the Krogan family we've got Toxic Croak and first attack nothing too special and poison boost giving you potential one-shot potential with Toxic Rogue. That's actually pretty neat. Now the downside of course is it costs three energy so that's not that good. I think that in Japan's XY on format it would make a lot more sense. There are a lot more ways you can abuse that but for any of our standard formats that's pretty bad. So we have the Scolipede line, we've got big damage output, no haha <laughs> just kidding it's actually pretty bad. I think Venoshock is kind of a cool thing for the Venipede but not a big deal. Yeah and it's just another bad Scolipede. Yeah it's bad. We've got the Meowstic family. You may actually think there's some potential here in Hand Kinesis, but I think you really need the right deck for that to work. And unfortunately, I mean, we were talking about three marginally good monkeys from Breakthrough. The Simi Sage, the Pan Sage, and then the Water Sage thingamajigger. Well, all three of those have the exact same attack as Hand Kinesis, and none of them are good. And they have better support. Like... The grass one, Simis Sage, has forced giant plants, and it's bad. So, I just give that a hard next. We got the Polisan family, and. Huh. Okay, so the Prevo doesn't really matter that much, but I think the Polisan is pretty neat. The first attack isn't anything incredible either, but. The second attack is kind of cool, so we're discarding all cards attached to both players' active Pokemon. That means that you're discarding all energy on Palo Sand. That is actually pretty rough because in order for that to be really good, you have to be in a situation where your four energy is really worth whatever you're discarding. So maybe there's like some marginal potential in a good deck out deck maybe, but I think you'll really need to stretch to find a good combo for this card. And right now I just don't see it. Now, Necrozma GX, I think this is a very, very good, very relevant card. <clears throat> especially because we just got off of an international championships that was won in part by a colorless attacker. So we have an auto block on colorless attackers. I mean, let's think about some more relevant cards like, I don't know, Mega Rayquaza. I mean, if that deck hasn't already been hit hard by Pseudo Wudo, this is even worse for it. And we got a couple pretty neat attacks. I think people have mentioned these are callbacks to Rayquazas in the past. And Prismatic Strand discarding all Psychic and dealing 60 for each you discarded. That means that if you have some sort of like energy acceleration psychic deck, this can be pretty good. I think that 
it can be another really effective fast attacker in the right situation. Unfortunately, I don't really know how effective it can be versus like the more efficient attackers don't require discards like Gardevoir GX. And then the GX attack 100 to all EX and GX is just a little too low to always make a difference, but I mean, let's think about it. EXs and GXs rule the format right now. We've got Garbodor, which runs EXs and GXs. We have Decidueye Vileplume, which runs lots of EXs and GXs. Everything runs to some extent EXs and GXs. The only question is if this is going to be worth it in a game, especially with a Psychic Weakness in. We have Garbodor the deck to beat, being a Psychic type Pokemon. So. I think you'll have to be careful with this card. I noticed in Japan that a couple of juniors won their, like a junior and a senior won their divisions at the national championship equivalent with this card. At least one of them did, I know that much. And I think that it can be okay. It's definitely a worthy tech in some decks. But all in all, I mean, y you need all the right stuff lined up for it to be really effective and i would say you'll just have to that's another card that's worth sleeping on a little bit like it's clearly a good card don't get me wrong but it's not quite as straightforward as other good cards where i mean we all saw garbador when it got released and we all knew oh my gosh this thing's incredible like one of those cards that you see it and you automatically know it's good i think this falls kind of in that camp but it isn't quite as obvious how to abuse it so Moving right along, we have Machamp GX. We have <clears throat> now lots of different ways to run Machamp. We have Machamp Break from Generations, which is pretty awful. But Crosscut dealing more damage to Evolution Pokemon, that's actually pretty neat. I think if you played really smart and you ran a good list, then a Machamp GX deck could probably have a really good matchup against uh, Drampa Garbodor. So that's already a pretty good thing i mean you got strong energy which deals more damage you got choice man you got kukui there are lots of ways to deal damage with fighting pokemon i mean you just saw that pile of swine video i posted so it's a possibility now bedrock breaker if you need a little bit more damage against something that's okay nothing to write home about and then muscle punch gx which is basically like a knockout maybe I, I don't really know if I'm a big fan of this GX attack, but eh, I mean, I think it can be okay. And I definitely think that a Machamp deck in general is even better when you're running it with a Machoke. Because let's do the math here. If you are playing against, say, Decidueye decks, you've already got some built in protection against those. If you are playing against a Garbodor variant, it depends on the list. If you're running against Drampa Garb, like we talked about, it's probably pretty good. If it's Espeon Garbodor, I don't really know. Like that, that might just be too much to overcome because they're dealing potentially one shot damage if you have two energy on this guy. That is not appealing. So we may have to wait and see how popular Garbodor will be going into worlds. I imagine it'll be popular, but. It has some potential. I don't really know, though. And then we've got the right Purier family. I think I've decided to get a little less patient with these Prevos, unless they're important. Just move on to the main dish. And Toppling Win is a reprint from a previous right Purier, discarding three from the top of your opponent's deck. It's not easy to put into play. It's not easy to maintain, but Super Scoop Up's been reprinted, so maybe that's something. And we've got Lunatone. Well, actually, before we go on to Lunatone, let's just think about uh, think about Rhyperia's potential and expanded. I, I don't really think there's that much there. There are better deck out decks. Uh, I mean, like, Duran is a better deck out deck. I think that Wailord is a marginally better deck out deck. Pound Doom, even, maybe. So, Toppling Wind, I think you'll have to see if all the exact right cards are there to combo with it because I don't really I don't see it I mean this card its previous version in the Diamond and Pearl series had a forest of giant plants for everything it was a card called Broken Time Space that let you evolve all of your Pokemon really quick on the first turn of the game even 
and even then a Rhyperior deck just wasn't that good like there were some niche Rhyperior decks but it wasn't really that playable I don't see it being playable right now we've got Lunatone I think this will always be a relevant tech because if you have a decent Soul Rock to work with I I can't off the top of my head think of like a really good Soul Rock you could run it with but Blocking Heal is a really, really neat ability. And it's actually, I think, unique to the standard format. The only other thing that can do that is Lunology X and Moongeist Beam, but as an ability, I think it's special. Unfortunately, if you ran this Saw Rock with that Lunatone, I think you wouldn't be that happy because it's not dealing that much damage. And to make matters worse, it's not even drawing that many cards, too, so. Actually, come to think of it, there is like some sort of Sol Rock that lets you search out special energy or something, so maybe that'd be better. And then the Lucario family. This is a neat ability and never... There's a Greninja promo that had this exact same ability that prevented all effects of attacks, including damage, but it never really saw that much play. This Lucario, I think that it could see a little bit more play because it's only a stage one, you may need some way to guarantee that you get energy into play easily, but I don't know. I kind of like it. And you know what I'm thinking about? If there are any better situations for it between standard and expanded, I would probably say that if it's going to have a good deck, it's probably going to have it in like standard versus expanded. Now let's look at Sock. Sock kind of socks. I mean, Quick Guard is a nice thing for fighting decks to have to hold off on the basic Pokemon onslaught. But if you like compare it head to head with Kabalion from Steam Siege, which also has Quick Guard, it's just not as good as that. It can get fetched with Level Ball, which might be marginally relevant for Worlds, but it's just. I mean, like, it doesn't have that much damage output for Brick Break. It's it doesn't ha it it doesn't have any good follow up. That's what I'm trying to say, and there's really not that much to abuse it. Let me look at the Crabominable family. And Gutsy Hammer, that that is actually pretty cool, because if you time it right, then it's not dealing any damage shit. So it could be a clear 100 or 130 or even more for like one energy without really having to suffer ill effects and even if you do have damage on this guy it isn't that big of a deal because no damage combination could knock itself out and then we have kind of a mediocre second attack nothing to write home about and if you flip deal more damage I don't trust my flips so I don't really know about that second attack but Keep a close eye on the first attack. I think that because it does, it, it serves a little bit more of a special niche in standard than expanded, so I say it would be better there. Not sure how great of a card it is, though, so keep an eye on it. And then, like, Can Rock is. Eh. 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 I don't know. Eh. I mean, like. It's really sad because this actually used to mean something, being able to deal that much damage for a single energy, but eh, I don't like it. And you know what? This like can rock the midday form like can rock is what they call it in the video games. It doesn't really fill any special niche. It does okay damage on the second attack for a non-EX, non-GX, but it doesn't serve much of a purpose. So about the only thing you might want it for is like a safeguard counter an Alolan Ninetales GX counter in Lycanroc decks. But you've already got gust effects with the Lycanroc GX, so I mean, I don't know. And then the Mudsdale family. The last Mudsdale from Guardians Rising was pretty awful. I was very sad to pull two copies of it in my last Guardian Rising box. The first attack is awful. The second attack is another Night Spear. Another functional Night Spear reprint. The only difference is it's 
it deals damage to itself for some reason like what what the heck why did they do that why are they doing that to this thing like i don't even get it i i, I think that they just want to abuse this card you know because if you look at all the cards throughout all the years this game has been around they tend to have some pretty consistent effects and abilities but some cards just get pigeonholed into being awful and right now we're 0 for 2 on decent mudsdales i think both have been awful cards this is another awful card 